thanks for the invitation, particularly um, thanks to Fran for organizing this and uh, to Molly Scott Cater for hosting this and for everyone else helping and participating. Um, I'd like to talk about strategic QE. Uh, we did a, a study at the New Economics Foundation on this, which you can download off their website. Um, and I'm going to uh, give a bit more background and a, a bit more expansion in 10 minutes, so I have to be brief. The idea is, as we've really heard very much in line with this, putting the monetary system, money and its creation to better use. Um, when did I get in, uh, interested in QE? Well, it was actually in 1995 when I proposed it. Um, this is the article in the Japanese Nikkei in September 1995 when I proposed to, after you know, a, a bust banking system type of recession, uh, it's, um, it's possible to get out of this recession if you create money for GDP transactions. Um, so the original definition of QE um, is actually money creation for transactions contributing to GDP. Central banks have made a bit of a hash out of it, but that's not really surprising. Um, it was also clear already at the time in the early 90s that lowering interest rates wouldn't work, fiscal stimulation that is not backed by bank credit creation, but bond issuance would not help, and um, just expanding bank reserves, the sort of thing they've been doing, which is an old thing, old monetarist policy, um, has failed very much in the past and clearly was, was not going to work again. Um, so very briefly, who creates and allocates the money supply that we'd like to put to better use to? And conducted a survey actually around Frankfurt um, um, with the help of students from Frankfurt University, over 1,000 uh, respondents. The question was, who do you think creates and allocates the majority of the money supply? Um, and the survey result is that over 84%, this is slightly slid, is only the first two items, government and the central bank. So 84% thought the government or the central bank creates the money supply, which is fair enough. This is, what, this is what common sense indicates. This is what it should be. But of course, uh, the correct answer is um, the banks. It's all slipped a little bit, but I think um, many of you may know this. So if you go to the next slide. Um, this is the trade secret of banking, what makes banks unique. If you borrow a thousand pounds or a thousand um, million pounds, as the case may be, whether you're a hedge fund or a private individual, what the bank does is it uh, purchases the loan contract because it's a promissory note and puts it on the asset side of its balance sheet, which therefore lengthens. Of course, the bank, according to the same loan contract, also has to pay out money, um, which is a liability, and now it simply records its uh, accounts payable liability arising from the loan contract as a fictitious customer deposit, which is not really correct, but that's what they do. Um, because the borrower clearly hasn't deposited this, and neither has the bank, nor has anyone else. So this is how the money supply is created out of nothing by the banking system. It's not transferred from anywhere else. Nobody has, the bank certainly hasn't given up anything. Um, which is, of course, why the justifications for usury charging interest go out of the window. Um, as a consequence, of course, banks are very special, they have a very unique position in the economy. They create the money supply. Um, <coughs> unlike non-bank financial institutions, um, they can do this. Everyone else, even the other financial institutions that do similar things. If they don't have a banking license, they can't create money. And that is credit creation. This is how 97% of the money supply is created. And banks make this decision. So we have allocators out there that constantly decide how much money should be created, who should be the money given to, and uh, for what purpose. Unfortunately, that's not coordinated in any sensible fashion, and you know the outcome of that. Um, Now, you can simply divide the money streams into, or credit rather, because that's where it comes from, the C stands for credit, into two streams, credit for the real economy and credit for asset markets. Um, 
So when the banks create money for transactions that contribute to GDP, such as investment or consumption, uh, you'll, you'll notice in nominal GDP. Um, but more often than not, and we had a lot of that um, in the last uh, years leading up to 2008, money creation for asset markets, of course, pushes up asset prices. So uh, you have basically three scenarios. Um, only one of them is sustainable, and that's the green box. Um, if bank credit goes into non-GDP transactions, asset transactions, you create an asset bubble, always unsustainable, it's a Ponzi scheme. It only works while banks keep creating more money, injecting into financial markets. Once that game stops, game of musical chairs, there aren't enough chairs, bankruptcies, and the banking system itself will be bust. But if uh, bank credit, sorry, still back, uh, bank credit goes into GDP transactions, there's still two possibilities. Consumption, that's easily understood, um, can lead to consumer price inflation because you create more money, but there aren't any more goods. But if it goes into investment, then we have money creation and also the creation of more goods and services, implementation of new technologies, and, uh, of course, properly defined productive means sustainable um, investment. Um, it's also environmentally sustainable. We can therefore create money for these uh, positive purposes without inflation and without negative consequences, and even when the economy is at so-called full employment. Um, I'm just going to whiz through the following charts because of time limitations. There's a lot of data work behind this, but can show how uh, you, know, you can test for this in various countries. You explain GDP with credit for GDP transactions. You explain asset prices with credit for um, financial transactions. Um, whenever the financial credit rises as a share of total credit and expands, you get this asset bubble like in the U.S. in the 20s, Japan in the 80s, and of course in the run-up to the crisis in many countries, um, including this is Japan, so too much credit when it exceeds GDP growth, you get this bubble and bust banking system. Uh, then many examples, Ireland, Spain, Greece, where we had 30-40% credit growth, uh, it wasn't really difficult to forecast what was going to happen next. The ECB um, should certainly have known. Um, but not all countries were affected um, because it's especially when you have a concentrated banking system with many large banks, then they don't want to lend to small firms which are a bit more productive. They lend rather to the big speculators. So uh, Germany did reasonably well. You didn't have in the, um, in the 2000s this excess credit um, because um, the, um, the majority of the banking system is the, the two green parts of this pie. 70% of banking is not-for-profit community banking, and um, that in the past has been more uh, productive and less speculative. Um, now, uh, central banks have not created money for the public good for several decades, and that's what we need to uh, introduce. Um, They've bailed out banks. Taxpayers have had to come up for this, but they haven't really done much for the economy. The uh, mortgage borrowers, uh, they haven't been bailed out. Um, one more. So strategic QE is about creating money for positive purposes, um, such as renewable energy, sustainable industries and sustainable energy, infrastructure, green infrastructure in particular, education, R&D, um, and... Uh, the people in general. Uh, if you look at growth, what constitutes growth, a lot of empirical studies have shown um, 90 to 95 percent of growth is due to technology. Um, and technology is created by R&D and education of people. So the single most important thing you need is people, which fits very much into um, our theme today. And there is a fundamental problem. Fertility rates have been collapsing ar across the world, as you know. Um, but you can do something about it. Um, Russia pays out a lot of money since uh, 2006 for new babies, and the baby bonus has dramatically changed the fertility rate and has raised it. Um, Australia has done the same thing um, and massively increased fertility. So uh, we can create money, pay it out for babies, and we solve the demographic problem, which is a massive problem for uh, society. Um, and this can be done in a number of ways. And this is my last slide. Um, it's not inflationary. It's linked to growth because the source of growth is people. Um, they're the most productive thing in the economy. So instead of spending um, 
500 billion on immigrants as Germany is doing, the Bundesbank can use its secret, but now slightly becoming less secret, liquidity quota to issue baby bonus euros, 100,000 euros per baby. Um, it will be far cheaper than what's currently going on. And you create a very sustainable economy together with uh, QE for green uh, renewable energy and industries. And uh, there's much more to say, um, but I'm out of time. Um, you can read up and perhaps be in touch. Thank you very much.